My name is Jan Ryan, and I'm Director of Creative Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the College of Fine Arts. And I cannot tell you how much I love being in a room full of, of entrepreneurs. The energy level um, and the, the ability to look into the future is always just exciting for me. So thanks for being here. I am uh, excited about the topic, actually, Design Thinking Meets Entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a couple of images throughout that you'll, you'll see are actually from our new school, which is the School of Design and Creative Technologies. This is, this is on opening night. We just opened the school. Um, it's like a startup inside of higher education in September. And I came on board about two, two months and three days ago uh, to help build and launch with a, with a fabulous uh, group of colleagues this new school. We, uh, I'll tell you briefly, we do have um, a, a degree program. We have a certificate, a 19 um, credit hour certificate for taking classes. And if there's interest in knowing more about us, we're, I'm around here afterwards. I'd, I'd love to answer questions. But I think the key today is really to focus on what it is that, uh, that the value, really, of um, design thinking for entrepreneurs and to really understand what entrepreneur or, or what design thinking means. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my, my background in just a minute and how I came to UT, but basically I'm an entrepreneur myself. I uh, sold a company to Oracle in 2006. Uh, my last company, Social Dynamics, was acquired by Lithium Technologies in San Francisco in 2012. And I've been using things and, and methodologies all these years that began to, to look more and more like what you're going to see today in design thinking because it was intuitive and it's what, what it was necessary in knowing what to build for, for the user. But when you think about where we are today, we are in a, um, an interesting age and I think you're going to find as you, you, know, you go through your studies and then go out into to the world, the real world, to get, to get that first job or launch your first business you're going to find that this is, this is an age that's hungry for innovation. I mean, hungry. I, I don't care if you live in Austin or Ontario or Tokyo, you're feeling the, the effects of this almost seismic shift in the market for the 21st century. A lot more competitive environments. I've never seen competition as fierce as it is today. You have product cycles getting shorter and shorter. You have these, these customers that are online all day, and they actually know more about your product than, than your salespeople do sometimes when they're coming online. So you have a, a scenario where it's really almost, you have to innovate or die. It, it's, a, it's, it's a scenario that we haven't seen before, but if you really want to separate yourself from the competition, you have to have innovation, not just for sustained growth. So there's no surprise that the, you know, the amount of, of emphasis we've seen on design thinking is now sweeping over the last several years, corporate America and through, throughout really a lot of universities as well. We are thrilled that the University of Texas has really now bought into having design in a cross-college um, way, across uh, all disciplines, bringing design into every, every discipline. But the, uh, this hunger for innovation really it, it, it almost it, it bothers me a little bit that we have this much buzz around design thinking for that because I'm not sure a lot of people even know what design thinking is. I think it's easy to get a lot of misconceptions about what design thinking is. I'd love to know from the room, what, what, what do you think design thinking is? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Wireframes? Good answer. Yeah. Anybody else? Customer center, that's, that's strong. Exactly, sliding on the other side of the table. Yep. I um, had a, a young entrepreneur a couple of weeks ago that actually said to me, you know, Jan, I don't think I may be very good at this because I'm still having trouble matching my pants and my shirts. And I, I don't think he knew exactly what, what, entre, what, what um, design thinking was, but it somehow got the feeling that it was more about aesthetics than it was about empathy. There was somebody who raised their hand. Yeah. Figuring out what you're doing and what you're not doing. 
I like that. What most of us think, really, when we first think of design thinking is about um, some of these large, deep pocket companies like Apple and um, you know, British Airways and uh, Google, these, these companies that are having these high profile uh, successes. And, and it's true. There, is, there are a lot of amazing results coming from these companies. In fact, the Design Management Institute says that design-led companies are having amazing performance over the last 10 years, uh, stock performance, outdoing the S&P 500 percent, I mean 219 uh, percent. What I want you to come out of here today, though, thinking is about what it is for entrepreneurs. We do think a lot about these big consultancies, IDEO and, and McKinsey, coming alongside, spending months on these projects with large companies. But it is actually an amazing tool for startups, for for young entrepreneurs, frankly, for a lot of different areas of problem solving. But what we're talking about today is entrepreneurs. How many of you have an active idea that you're pursuing as an entrepreneur today? Wow, nice. All right, so you know, you know the obsession. You know, what, you know what we're talking about in trying to get to a place where we know what our customers really want. Let's, let's try to arrive at a little bit better definition by looking at what design thinking is not. It's, it's not art. It can actually get confused with, with art a lot. Design thinking is, um, let's see if I can go forward here. It's not about elegantly designed products, believe it or not. It's not about the interfaces that we we think about with our devices. It's actually not about UX. It's, it's, there's some of that in there, but that's not what design thinking actually can do for you as, a, as an entrepreneur. I've got a bit of a drag. It's not, it's not about design, um, high, high profile design. It's not about matching your pants with your, with your shirts. What Job says so elegantly, I think, is that design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is what it, what it actually does. It, it's how, how you bring something that's real to a customer. And by the way, design is important for all of us in many ways. Every, you know, every day we think about design being involved with our commute, with the way that we interact with our applications and laptops. Design is something that is in, in every part of our life. But design thinking is that we actually should call this design doing. It's a verb. It's an action. It's a methodology. It's something that's actually going to change the way you and your team approach how you're doing things for your customers in the 21st century. It starts with this radical approach on human needs. A couple of you had talked about the human centricity of this. This is bringing a methodology around how you do that. I think we all know we need to do that, but it's actually, it's actually pretty difficult to do without some sort of systematic way of looking at it. And what does this mean for entrepreneurs? We've seen designers actually do this work for years. This is their core way of working, right? And, and yet, entrepreneurs have not been thinking about these things. This has is, this is somehow been left out of what, an, what a designer actually does. Uh, as a, as a, an investor and an entrepreneur that did a lot of mentoring, which, by the way, it's, I've probably mentored over 200 companies at this point, I see a lot of different deals and a lot of different opportunities. And I almost always ask the, um, the entrepreneur um, first, you know, tell me a little bit about the problem. Tell me, tell me what problem you're trying to solve. And immediately, especially if it's a first-time entrepreneur, they'll start in with all these amazing features and what we're doing that no one else is doing, and they're very proud of this technology. Very rarely do they talk about the problem. And if they do, it's, it's like an inch thick. It's just a common thing that, we, that we, we see, and I'm sure I did that in the very early days as well. We also, if I ask them the second question, it's tell me a little bit about your customers. And they'll say, well, I don't have any customers yet. And, well, tell me a little bit about your potential customers. And again, it's, it's a struggle a little bit because they're, they're really much more wondering, why am I not more excited about all these great features that, that you know, they just gave me and, and all the things that we can do that no one else can? Guys, this is where we get ourselves in a lot of trouble. And as you think about what you're doing in launching a, a startup, 
you can really start to understand that, that with all good intentions and lots and lots of hard work, because I, I rarely see an entrepreneur that doesn't just work really hard. But after all of those and months later, you may find yourself no closer to understanding if you've got a scalable idea or not. And you've spent Uncle Joe's money now and you're exhausted and you're trying to figure out, you know, is this, is this really for me? So when we look at this, and much like designers, when they say, when I learn this methodology, it's like putting on a pair of glasses and I, I see things differently. If we go through this with this lens, we're also going to see things differently. And we're going to be able to unpack major complex problems and understand how to, how to deal with those problems in a systematic way. And that's really the purpose and why we're here today. So let me talk about being an entrepreneur just for a minute. Being an entrepreneur is an amazing thing. Um, you're, you're cut just a little bit differently. You probably have a little bit of a problem sometimes being comfortable with the status quo, yeah? Maybe you don't follow directions that well and don't really want to follow the rules. You may have even some problems with authority. There's a lot of things they say about entrepreneurs. But one thing that we all have in common is this desire, this like burning passion to build something that someone else just loves. And I can tell you that when you get close to that and you actually are able to do that, there is a huge rush around doing that. But in this world, it's, you know, it's very uncertain. There's a lot of questions about things. It's a complex environment. We really need to understand that it's easy to miss the mark. And these kind of methodologies are actually um, very, very important in understanding how to get around that and make, make what you're doing even more fun. I'll say a few words about my own journey, which, by the way, the, the journey was, was basically uh, characterized by understanding that the customer's voice is the only one that matters. I have come to learn that only the customer's voice matters. It doesn't actually matter that much what your investors say, even what, what lecturers say or what your mentors say. The customer will determine whether or not this is, is a great experience for you or, or not. And, and that is the, the key to, to the whole process here. But my, my journey, I, I started out with IBM, Vignette, uh, Oracle through an acquisition. Most of what I've done has been uh, characterized by first, technology first. For some strange reason, I'm, I'm attracted to edgy things and when something's new. And, and I, at, at Vignette, the, the company in the middle there, we did an IPO in, in 1999. But that was actually the company where I, I learned 20 years ago to think more, more about the early adopter and the, the customer's point of view. This is where design thinking started to make sense for me. Because we built something early on that people did not necessarily want to buy. We were the first company on the internet to build a, an enterprise software company. Um, and they were used to downloading things for free. And we were selling you know, an $88,000 content management package. Well, guess what? They all wanted to talk to us, and we were still calling the, the web the World Wide Web with a straight face, and no one wanted to buy from us. So we really had to understand what it was that they would buy and who, who would buy, what, what motivated them. The, um, the, the picture over on the right is actually my last company, Social Dynamics, that was sold to Lithium. And this is a picture of our exec team actually on a... Um, um, a, a, a little excursion after we had just signed the paperwork in San Francisco to be acquired. Um, one thing I'll say, I, I was looking at this this morning, this picture, and I, I just thought, what a small world it is, because uh, Morton Mueller on the right, the, our VP of products, the, the guy who's standing on the right, actually I l lured him and we, we stole him from IBM. He was very schooled in design thinking, but his old boss is actually now one of our key partners at the at the School of Design and, and Creative Technologies at IBM, still doing design thinking in amazing ways and actually has a, a class that he has for our students on site. So IBM does a, a, a class for design. Um, anyone can take this, any, anyone who applies um, on site. And that's, that's Morton's old boss. But basically what I learned there is, first of all, don't build the first thing that comes to mind. Test quickly. If I had built the first thing, and I, I, want you, I, I literally talked to hundreds of people. That was even before we were building the team. And 
If I had done that and built what I was passionate about, this is in the social space, by the way, it's social analytics, social customer care. I would have probably gone out with something in marketing because that's what everything was in those days for, for early social was marketing. But you, you've heard the phase, you know, to skate where the puck is going, not where, where it is. This was, this was proof in the pudding for me because I, instead of going for, um, for uh, marketing, we actually built a product in customer service because that's where no one was. And we developed that and that's what made us able to stand out in a very, very busy, noisy market. The other is the customer's experiences are more important than actually what they'll tell you about their approaches. Many times when you're doing this due diligence, and we're going to talk about really getting out and talking with your customers, they, they, they're so close to the problem. They've built all these workarounds and approaches. That's not what you need to listen to. You need to listen to their experience and what's missing. And, and we'll talk a little bit about what we, what, how we go deeper than that. But they can't always tell you what they want. They, they can tell you what they're doing. Innovation versus incremental. If you, if you are, just need something incremental, you don't actually need um, innovation. So if you're building, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, design thinking. If you're building something right now and you're just wanting to make things just a little bit better, that's actually, you don't, you don't really need all of this in the, the, the methodology. We're, but if you're trying to do something innovative and create a new um, way of solving a problem and getting down into you know, a, a user's unmet needs, that's where this comes into place. You will always find, by the way, a skeptical, skeptical majority. Uh, in this particular world, I was, in, this is 2009, and I was talking about an enterprise scalable platform for social when none of these big companies thought that this was important. You know, they would tell me, Jan, that's what my, uh, my teenager does, Facebook. But I could see that there was these tens of thousands of mentions of their brand every day in these social channels, multiple social channels. And they were, at some point, going to need to know how to respond back to their customers. So as the entrepreneur, you need to understand you're the one who's got the passion. Keep going. We, um, we, we literally talked and sat with, with um, dozens of, of customer service um, professionals and even even before they knew what they needed we were trying to interview them and understand what their problems were when they went cross-functional when they went um, on multiple time zones when they had streams of social posts and they were just struggling to respond with it the one thing I'll say about good ideas and big ideas they're not always new ideas you know, most of the time, they're actually a couple of old ideas that you merged together and did something new with. And that may be where you're, where you're coming from with some of your own ideas. It's, it's being able to get a lot of people in the room or have lots of different things coming back in terms of feedback and merging those into something that's, that's unique. And that's what we did at, at, uh, at Social Dynamics. The, uh, and, and by the way, connecting customers on social anywhere at any time um, was, was what the key was. The reason I put this last slide about, about my experience is that the number one thing that we listed in our values, most of us will go through and we'll put you know, our top 10 values or whatever. Our top value was team as a, a strategic asset. And we, we always called ourselves the United Nations of, the United Nations of SDI, social dynamics, because we had one of each. We had, we had someone from every nationality, we had someone from different disciplines because we had to have analytics and customer service and social. But that was the key to why we were successful in being able to get all of these people brainstorming together and coming up with something new and innovative. Okay? Everybody following me? We can't really talk about innovation, though, without talking about creativity. Now, let me just say a moment here about Creativity. Most of us think we, we aren't creative anymore. Um, you know, the, the, the sad truth is that as we grow up, creativity does actually tend to diminish. And it's probably because we had this, you know, background that most of us were in, where, which was memorization-based education. Or maybe we're in the workforce and we're having to be in silos. But we do lose our creativity. The interesting thing, though, about that is that in the Tibetan language, there is actually no word for creativity. 
Um, I, I discovered that about a year ago in reading an article that really intrigued me because it, the, the, the closest thing they had to creativity was the word natural. So the idea there is that if you want to be creative, you just need to be natural, which means we do have the ability to be creative at our natural state. I mean, most of us are, uh, you know, we can't remember that in kindergarten we were like, playing with all these weird things and, and, and creating and exploring. And, and we didn't have a fear at that time or a shame of being socially rejected. So creativity is actually something that's in, as important in education as um, literacy. That came straight out of a uh, Tom Robinson, who's a, who's a thought leader in education, had a, a YouTube video that, I mean, not a YouTube, but a TEDx video that he I thought was fabulous about two years ago, which basically asked the question is, you know, are our schools killing creativity? And the whole premise of that was how we actually have to go back to something that's the most important thing that we do in education. So I want to just briefly kill that myth and dispel the thought that you can't be creative, that we all can't be creative. It's interesting that the more I talk to business people, the less they want to be acknowledging them, themselves as being creative. They, they're, they're willing to say innovative, but not necessarily creative. And then if we go over into uh, the fine arts or into some of the more artistic fields, it's the opposite. They think they can't, they don't know business as well. How many of, how many of you, I'm going to see what schools we're from, what colleges are we from, how, how many from Macombs today? OK. And how many from natural sciences and engineering? It's a great mix. Wow. How about uh, College of Fine Arts? So we have, a, we have a, a wide group, but everyone, just want to make the point, everyone can be creative. It's, it can be blocked, and it is blocked for most of it, but that means it can be unblocked. And what we're doing at the School for Design and Creative Technologies are unblocking. We're unblocking and creating classes that can help people do that. It's not a fixed trait. Because it actually matters how you think. Now, I'm, I'm not going to have time to go deep into the stages of, of design thinking. I'll go a little bit deeper than this in just a moment. But I want you to know that there's a process here. And I want you to be exposed to that process so you can learn more if you want. But design thinking is about changing your mindset and the way that you approach different problems. Design thinking is about designing and, and defining the problem. Notice, notice this. Don't let this slip past you. The problem as actively as the solution. We spend a lot of time thinking about the problem. This is what's going to keep you as an entrepreneur from running down certain paths that, that you may be excited about that actually may or may not be the right path ultimately to go. It's, it's the problem that we identify. This innovator, Jeff Bezos, who, who is, is phenomenal, but he says in the old world, you devoted 30% of your time to building a great service and 70% of your time to shouting about it. That is actually inverted in today's world. I love that quote. The, uh, the point to that is you, you have to be able to understand what it is you're building uh, before you go out. And, and my buddy Albert Einstein, if I had a, a, an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes on the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. What is it about entrepreneurs that we have a hard time with that? Just, you know, we, want, we, we want to get out there. We don't want something that slows us down. So we're, 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 we're going to have a, a, you know, a hard time on our own just thinking deeply about the problem. But what if you could actually speed up your time from product to market and to, to be able to understand what you're going to do more creatively if you had this technology, I mean, this uh, methodology? So I'm going I'm to go show you a little bit about four key aspects or four tenets of design thinking. Now, there, there are multiple variations sometimes of the stages of design thinking, but uh, rarely does anyone not include these four actual tenets. The first one is phases of both divergent and convergent thinking. So divergent just means that you are opening everything up. You're able to, to ideate and to, you know, to consider and explore without any restraint. 
so that's one thing that we have a hard time sometimes also, especially in business, is you know, just, just exploring deeply. Don't, don't try to bring somebody down to say that's not possible. You're out, you're in, in design thinking, you are encouraged to try to think about everything possible. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The second key tenet is that it's rooted in human empathy. This is something that is, is very interesting to learn because you're gonna channel the empathy of the people that you're trying to create value for, okay? You're gonna immerse yourself inside your customer environment in the context of where they are. You, you have to do a little preparation. What do you wanna learn? You, know, you have to think ahead and, and work for this, but this is another key tenet for, for um, empathy. The third one is multidisciplinary collaboration. You know, in psychology, we know that uh, we're, we're carrying around a brain inside our skulls that the left half of it processes um, logic and you know, more analytical thinking and, and, and those kinds of things, those functions. And we know that the right hemisphere is actually where we control creativity and um, a lot of the imagination that we have and emotions. It's very interesting in this particular methodology, you're gonna end up using both. You're gonna be taught to use both. And you may sway one, one way a little more naturally than the other, but, but most of us, it's kind of a cop out that we have to say, oh, I'm left brain or I'm right brain. You, you can be whole brain. And using this methodology, we're gonna, we're gonna show you how that actually needs to, to, to come into play. Uh, one of the only disciplines that I know of that does that. The other thing about multidisciplinary that I want to point out is this also should tell you a little bit about who you want to choose for who you interview and you explore with on your deal. Because if you're, if you're let's say you're you know, three developers and you've got an idea and you, you go out and you start to want to go build that, you're going to look at things from the developer standpoint. So the end product is gonna be what? Kind of technical, most likely. If our goal is innovation, then we need to bring in all these different points of view. So as you and your buddy or someone in your college dorm or whoever you've hooked up with to, to launch something, when you start to think about what skill sets you have and what perspective you had, you have to think today about diversity if you are really pursuing innovation. The third key tenet is what our, our buddy, again, reminds us. If I can't picture it, I can't understand it. It's this whole thing in design thinking about making and prototyping. This is where it's fun. We, we have so much fun with this because we're encouraged to actually make something, even if it's just in cardboard or you know, pipe cleaners, make something that actually expresses what your deal is and that your, your uh, potential customers can see. Because when you put a little prototype, even if it's a throwaway, you put that in front of somebody and they're gonna give you feedback. They're gonna go deeper in that feedback. Almost nobody learns anything from a, um, you know, a PowerPoint. Today's lesson excluded, right? You, you need to be able to build something so that they can actually take a look and unpack the complexity of the problem in that way. Okay, so you have an idea. You're an entrepreneur, you have an idea. How do you know it's the right one? Maybe it's something that you actually came up with and, and it's from your perspective. How do you know that that's not um, you know, something that you have a lot of prejudice around, that you are bringing your own, own thoughts around that? Steve Blank tells us to get out of the building. And it's so true. Anybody a Steve Blank fan? Get out of the building means go out and get into your, um, in your audience uh, in their world. Understand what they're seeing get into their context. And it's almost impossible to do design thinking without that. So get ready. It's about active listening. And listening more than you, than you ask and you talk. One of the things I'll tell you, every single person in this room, questioning and learning how to listen is probably the most important thing you can do in business. The most important skill that you will learn in every discipline. It's particularly important here. You want to pr prepare questions to explore their needs. You know, instead of, for example, what do you think about blank? Ask them, you know, what, when's the last time you faced a challenging situation and what did you do about that? 
It's learning to go deeper. These are the types of things that, that also, um, you know, a workshop and a class can help you understand. How do you go deeper in, in questioning? And then this one is a personal um, favorite of mine, psychographics. I believe you know so much more about psychographics than, than demographics. But they're both important. Demographics will tell you who your customer is, right? Psychographics are going to tell you why they are interested in buying, why it matters. What are they motivated to do? What are they um, worried about? Why, who are they charted to go pursue? Who are, they, you know, who are they trying to please? What are they doing for their boss? This is what psychographics is about. Now this is just, again, a, a look at the sequence of, of action phases that you go through to, to execute the design process. It's empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And you're going to notice that on the, on the, the left-hand side, these two are about the problem. These three stages are about the solution. We, we actually segregate those very um, carefully. You're, you're spending a lot of time inside the problem, and it's probably the most important stage is defining that. And then you're actually going to create based on what you've discovered. So inside the first and second stage, is interviewing and, and, and talking to your targeted personas. You're looking for a lot of manual workarounds. You're watching your people as you're talking to them, making sure that you understand how they're doing something today, but also what their, their feelings are about how they do that. You're deferring judgment. Just don't put your prejudices in. Uh, don't allow somebody on your team to say, oh, that wouldn't work. This is about this, this divergent thinking that I was talking about. Welcome wild ideas. I don't, I don't, on this one, I don't know really what the, the dynamic is here, but when you just let yourself go wild on these ideas, you start coming up with innovation. It's almost like you are clearing the palette. Just, just let, let your team just throw ideas out there, even if they're not even practical. And before you know it, something kind of emerges that's, wow, that, that actually might work. And then you start to combine these ideas, and you start to see how they're connected to certain insights. This is, what, this is what this early stage of, of design thinking is about, and building off of each other's ideas. The problem is basically you're, you're asking these questions. I have a challenge. How do I approach it? And then I've learned something. How do I interpret it? This is where we're going deeper and trying to understand how to get comfortable with just throwing a lot of ideas out there. But you, after you've explored it, you have to have the ability to let it go. And, and, and no fear of failure. This is really healthy for entrepreneurs to go out and lose their fear of failure by just exploring and, and putting something aside, explore again, putting something aside. We're all sort of hardwired with some sort of fear of failure. We, you know, we grab onto something and we gotta go make that thing work. And that's, that's the opposite of what we should be doing. The solution, where we're actually coming up with an idea that, um, you know, what, what might be the best thing to go build on the prototype is, is all about being able to go out and, and, and um, together you're understanding, let's see if I can get my thing to go, you're understanding which of these actually have more value. And you're brainstorming, you're, you're back to the divergent thinking again, but based on the things that you've, you've been able to come up with and, and understand from your phase one and two. You're prioritizing those, and this is where you're building some of these mock-ups. And someone mentioned, you know, wireframes. You can do that, storyboarding. This is where you, it's highly iterative, highly iterative. So you're wanting to um, create uh, examples that are real for your customers, and then some of those are going to uh, emerge up to the top to be the ones that you actually end up with. And then you're, you're often going to return back to the original group, your user group, and test for ideas and what works and what doesn't work. So I'm going to move past these, these couple of slides because I want to get to um, a time for Q&A. And there's a few things here I really wanted to, to go for. Have, have any of you done product, uh, you know, business model canvases? So a lot of these different methodologies and things are very healthy and very, uh, very appropriate for you as entrepreneurs. There's only about four areas in the business model canvas that are important early on in trying to understand how to fit this into design thinking. And it's what's the value proposition 
And when I'm talking about value, I'm talking about what your customer says is value, not what we say. Because many times we're trying to say, here's my benefit and here's its benefit. That's not value. Value is when the customer feels that they've received value, okay? Uh, who's going to be your customer? How are you going to reach them? And how are you going to make money? Now, I'm going I'm to end this with a, just a few slides about something that's really, really important for you to get, especially in the early stage. And that is that most of us fail to actually think even about our first adopters, our early adopters. We're thinking about the grand scheme of customers, but the truth is, that customers that buy from you today are going to look very different than customers that buy from you two years from now. It's a whole different um, grouping of customers. I mean, you think about it. Who's going to buy from a company that's brand new, underfunded, you know, never, never been heard of before? The truth is about 8 to 10 percent of the companies or the, the customers out there will. And they're in a whole different breed called an earlier adopter. The reason this is important is that you have a very short runway. We don't realize it sometimes, but as, as entrepreneurs, we don't have that long to get this right. And if you have a short runway, you better spend it with people that can actually write a check. So many of the times we forget that customers are defined by what? They're writing a check. They're, they're spending money. They're, they're using their credit card. This is a fun little cartoon by Tom Fishborn, which just shows you your customers at different stages. Most of you have seen the chasm. But your, you know, your first customers are saying, wow, brilliant. You know, you're a little further along. I heard Ashton Kutcher has one. And then, oh, I found it at Sam's Club. You're dealing with these guys. You've got to wow. There's got to be someone that you actually are working with that wants to be first. And they're called early adopters. And you've got to be able to find them or, more importantly, get found by them, which is my, my wish to you, that you would understand that if you're in the right um, channels, if you're, if you're in the right places, you will be found by these early adopters. They're very different. They uh, are driven almost always by emotion. If you're selling something technical and it's, it's in a company, B2B, it's almost always somebody who just got a, a promotion, believe it or not. Uh, it, was, it was interesting for me to find that out about 10 years ago that most of the early adopters either have a brand new job or they just got a promotion. And why do you think that is? Because they, they have something to prove. They want to be first. They want to show something. They actually want to, uh, to make a difference quickly. And these are the different uh, techniques that you can use. I just want to give you a little preview of the types of things that you learn to do in, in design thinking to flesh this out. And to, to help you understand that you have to narrow your focus. It, it's almost something that seems non-intuitive for, for entrepreneurs early on, but the more you know, the, the narrower your, you, your target is, and the faster you scale, the better off you are early on. Because you want to put a flag in the sand somewhere, pick it back up, and then go to the next one after you have proven that first one. You will be far, far more successful if you can narrow your early adopters. I'm not going to go through this because it was, you know, the point to that was that it, literally sometimes they are very different than what you think they might be. When you go through design thinking, you'll, you'll understand who your early adopters are. Human-centered design, is it viable, which has to do with business, feasible, technology, and usable, which is about empathy. Let me, uh, well, I'll end on this one, <laughs> one, one picture. The, uh, the point of this picture is as entrepreneurs, and I've worked with so many of them, and I was one, I don't know how you could work any harder. This is, this, it gets to be hard work. It's like an obsession. You can't work any harder, but you can work smarter. And that's the point to design thinking. There's lots of different types of methodologies we can use, and at an appropriate time, there's, one, there's, there's opportunities to use many of them. But don't let the methodology control you. It's really more about you know, what you're trying to do for your customer and, um, and how to please and delight your customer. So let me open it up for questions. That's, that's a quick overview of design thinking. Yeah. Technically, how do you, or, or practically, how do you uh, facilitate design thinking? It's, it's actually methodology. Now, you can't, there are some tools that can come into play to help you to flush a lot of this out, but it's more about methodology and really being able to experientially go through these things.
So what most people love about design thinking is that it's kind of like play in some of the early stages because you're in experiential exercises. You're actually going out and coming back and working with multiple disciplines and different teams. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that it was highly associated with, with uh, technology, much like some other disciplines might be that are technical. So I think your question is when to approach a, um, an angel or someone that is, that is potentially able to give you money. When you know that you have um, real customer validation is my personal opinion. You really either need to have customers, which would be nice, or you know that customers, real customers, have said that they would buy this if you did these three things, you know, letters of intent, different things like that. Because you're really just in an exercise of visiting and talking, if not. You know, you're, you're getting a, a, an investor to come visit with you, but they're, they're, they may give you advice, but they're not going to give you money. If you have investor, I mean, uh, customer feedback, validation, there, there is an opportunity for you to be much more uh, effective in, in talking to angels. Is, is design thinking a mindset? It's very uh, intuitive of you to pick that up. It is a mindset. Mindset, in other words, you're, in some ways you're asking the question, how do you get a mindset? You know, because it is a mindset, but it's not a mindset alone. It's a mindset that is, is uh, backed up by many, many opportunities to see how this works. It's a methodology that produces the mindset. So in other words, one of the skills that I, I feel like I gained about 20 years ago when it was like even at Vignette, when it was so hard to understand who was going to buy from us in the beginning, the ability to always think about sliding on the other side of the table and seeing things from other people's uh, perspective was huge. It was huge. It has changed my life that I constantly try to think about what someone else is, is thinking inside of a problem-solving scenario or just a relationship issue. So when you think about a mindset, it could mean many things. It's kind of a, a fuzzy term and almost doesn't seem like it can be measurable. Um, but it is a mindset. You end up realizing that the customer's voice is the only one that matters. And I don't need to go out and rush out and build the first thing that I see. I need to understand, are there customers who have a need here and that would express value if they had this? There's all kinds of exercises that you can go and you can compare what someone is doing a day in the life type thing today, and then what would they actually be doing if they were using my solution? And that, you know, I don't call that necessarily a mindset, but even the approach to do that is something that's learned. Now, we can change the way we think. That's one, that's one of the light bulbs that'll go on in your life that you realize that thinking can be changed and and, and, and for the better, but that's, that's the training of your mind, if that, makes, if that makes sense. Well, it's a really good question. She's saying, how, for those in the back of the room, how do, you, how do you, when you're in a highly technical team, and maybe empathy is not the first thing that they come up with, it's not a natural thing for them, how do you encourage that? This methodology encourages it. So whether or not you are just empathetic, that's not exactly what we're talking about. You know, some people are empathetic, some people need to learn to be more empathetic. This is about thinking about what your customer has to say. So empathy is a huge skill. You know, and frankly, a lot of um, females have a lot of empathy, and they do very well here because they end up being more empathetic about what the customer's thinking. But that doesn't mean you have to be empathetic to be able to do this. It's a great learning exercise to go through design thinking and learn to be empathetic. What does the customer need? What is it that they actually can't even express that's an unmet need, that the customer can't even articulate? You learn processes. It's, again, it's back to learning how you think. You learn those processes. And you will take that skill with you for the rest of your life. Empathy is uh, the way to be a, the right leader, the right parent, the right um, spouse. Empathy is, is a strong skill, not just in business. But yeah, you can learn empathy big time. There is literally nowhere you couldn't um, bring design thinking in. It has been used all over the world, and, and sometimes, many times, just to solve problems, not just necessarily for entrepreneurs. So you absolutely could use it in social work. 
there, there is, there's nothing to keep that from being effective. He was, he was a very early uh, design thinker, yes, in many different types of ways. There, you know, design thinking, I'm not even sure when it became that term. That term has not lived on um, you know, for decades, but Stephen Jobs had some of the earliest uh, innovation, um, the thinking behind that, that that we have all learned from. And many of what he, much of what he went through is incorporated. So yes, I mean, I, I can't say that he had designed thinking necessarily. Today we, we see those words used in Google and Apple and all of the, you know, the major, truthfully, the, the major companies are using design thinking today. I don't, I don't know if he used those words. But yeah, he absolutely, it's all compatible with what he thought. Yeah. What personally motivated me to be in software, coming from business? I started out with IBM and you know, we all have a story and I ended up being in an early stage company in my late 20s that was in software. And I absolutely loved it because what I learned, what I was doing was building sales teams and came up the track through sales. And you know, as what we call a chief revenue officer. But for big companies, which is where I targeted, that's nothing but problem solving. You are building the team to solve someone's problem. That's, that's the way you sell, it's the way you sell well. So I was motivated you know, by solving problems, to be truthful, and it ended up being in software. But I'm equally as motivated in uh, multiple ways um, today with consumer products. I do a lot of things with women entrepreneurs who tend to go into more innovative, uh, creative fields. But software, I guess, was just a part of my background. It was, it was easy for me to, to do, to, to work with. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Oh, you're, you're, so, uh, you're so right. Design thinking is very effective in nonprofits and government. Um, you know, there, there is, I agree with you, a need for more. But one of the things I'm excited about at the University of Texas is that this, you know, as a flagship university, our commitment to design thinking is rippling. And just much like what happened uh, with the D school, the design school, you know, in California, um, we, we will influence our, our state of Texas and beyond by doing some of the things we're doing. I will tell you that we are working with state and local governments um, at, the, you know, at the design and, and creative technology school. Uh, our Austin um, um, government actually in, inside of our, you know, our, our, our city municipal government is very interested in design thinking. So some of that's coming, but I, I agree with you that it needs to happen um, on a much wider scale because it, it actually is, is bringing out these 21st century uh, skills and needs that I, I don't know that a lot of other you know, methodologies that I've seen are able to do as effectively. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Is it adopted more by young than old? I'll have to say at least half my time I'm, I'm spending with uh, older uh, because you know executives across the nation, across the globe, honestly, are embracing this. I just came from a meeting where that, you know, certainly wasn't just young people. But young people are so hungry and, and innovative that many times they're the ones that are carrying out some of these projects. So they're, you know, it's, they're, that's, I think that's why some of our students are so highly sought after and so, you know, marketable because companies need people to be creative. That's a huge thing right now. They want new ideas. Okay, guys, well, listen, I'll let everybody get back to their days, but thank you for, for coming, and if there's any questions, let us know.